Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at Morphe's taking a look at a Ruger KAC-556. This was Bill Ruger's attempt to get military and police and security contracts for what was essentially a select fire version of his Mini-14 rifle. So the Mini-14 was introduced in 1973, and it was a little bit too late to really compete for, say, a US military contract. There's also some question as to whether the gun was really quite rugged enough uh, to have passed those tests and beaten the M16, but uh, it is a theoretical possibility. At any rate, uh, Ruger would sell that rifle for a couple years while working on a select fire model, which requires a completely different fire control group, and actually involves a different casting for the receiver, which we'll take a look at in a minute. And he released this onto the, uh, well, not the commercial market so much, but the international security market in 1979. He would get a few small clients for it. Um, these were actually relatively popular with a lot of smaller police agencies, especially agencies that were looking for weapons that were technically comparable to the M16, which is to say select fire or full auto 556, but didn't quite look as scary or military. The Ruger has this very friendly, neighborly looking wood stock, and that actually made a big difference to a lot of police agencies, and that was a major source of AC-556 uh, purchases. However, there were a couple large military contracts as well, or a couple small military contracts, sorry. Um, the Royal Bermuda Regiment apparently bought 500 of them, the US State Department bought some of them. The biggest of these was actually sale to the French. The French CRS, or Compagnie Républicaine de Sécurité, uh, who do... Uh, they do a lot of public security, uh, riot control, that sort of um, work. They purchased uh, Ruger AC-556s and ultimately contracted to manufacture guns in France under the name of Mousqueton AMD, which is... there are a few variations, differences between that and the original Ruger Mini-14 or AC-556, and that's a subject for a future video when I can get my hands on an AMD. But suffice to say, uh, the French police agencies actually came to uh, a good working relationship with Ruger, and they would buy essentially converted uh, Mini-14s, and they would also buy a variety of revolvers based on Ruger revolver designs. So, uh, just for a little bit of nomenclature's sake, what we have here is a KAC-556. The leading K indicates that it is made of stainless steel. Without that, it indicates a blued steel gun. This has an 18 and a half inch barrel. The other option that was available was a 13 inch barrel, typically paired with a folding stock that got the designation AC-556F for folding, or KAC-556F if it was stainless steel. Now, there are some serious mechanical differences between this and a regular Mini-14. The action is identical. It's a short stroke M1 carbine style tappet gas piston. Uh, the rotary two lug locking on the bolt is identical. However, the fire control mechanism and the receiver itself are different. So let's take a close look at that. Ruger as a company never offered these on the civilian market, although it would have been perfectly legal to do so. Uh, they instead preferred to only offer them to police and military agencies. What we have in here right now is a 20 round magazine, which is what Ruger sold with their semi-auto Mini 14s. With the AC-556, they did also uh, introduce and offer a 30 round magazine of the same basic design, which they opted not to sell uh, to the civilian market. They're of course perfectly legal to have. Now the place where we're going to see a visible difference on this gun compared to the Mini-14 is the back end of the receiver. So of course it's actually marked 556 instead of Mini-14. And then it's got this three position selector switch on it. So the top position is 1, the middle position is 3, and the bottom position is A. A little harder to see down there. Uh, and the, the 556 actually has a three round burst as well as an unlimited full auto option. Now there's a little bit of funkiness with the three round burst. This is a ratchet based mechanism, and we'll take a look inside in just a moment, um, but it does not reset automatically. So the ratchet is always counting rounds, and you know even if you're in full auto or semi-auto. So when you go to fire a burst the first time, you really have no idea whether it will be one, two, or three rounds, because that, that counter is incrementing every time the rifle is fired in any mode. After you fire the first burst, it will reset, and your next burst will be three rounds, as long as you hold the trigger down for the whole burst. 
If you let go of the trigger early and fire only one or two rounds, uh, and then release the trigger and go to fire another burst, your second burst will only be the remainder of the first three round burst before the uh, ratchet counter resets. Clear as mud? Alright, let's take this apart. Alright, the first step on disassembly is make sure the gun is cocked, and empty of course, and then set it to semi-auto. Don't disassemble this if it's not in semi-auto or you will break something. Now I'm going to use a punch here to give me some leverage. This opens up just like an M1 Garand, or obviously a Mini-14, and I can slide the fire control group out. There are some extra bits on here compared to a Mini-14. Then I can just pop the stock, the action, out of the stock. You can see we've got some extra bits. Let's start by taking a quick look at the inside of the receiver. Of course we have the selector switch on the back here, and what that's going to do is simply rotate this lug forward and back. You'll see what that does in a moment. This piece here is what would typically be called the safety sear, or the auto sear. What it does is ensure that the, the rifle doesn't fire out of battery, and it doesn't have hammer follow. So if you're holding the trigger down, this lever prevents the, gun, the hammer from dropping unless this is pushed into the downward position, which it's currently in. Actually, this goes down, that goes up. When the bolt is open, this spring pushes this lever up, well, up at the front, and you can see the difference right there. So when firing in full auto, uh, the whole thing is cocked, and the, the sear in the fire control mechanism is released, because you're holding the trigger down, but the hammer doesn't actually drop until the bolt gets to there which means that the locking lugs are fully in battery, right back here, and it's safe to fire. Now if we compare our AC556 receiver to a standard Mini-14 receiver, you'll see that there are a couple subtle differences. The AC556 has more space inside the receiver back on this corner, where the Mini-14 is rounded forward. You can also see on this angled surface, it's shorter on the AC556 because the opening in the receiver is a little bit wider at the back, and that's to accommodate the extra full auto parts in the fire control group. What that means, as well, is that you cannot simply change a Mini-14 to an AC-556 by swapping fire control parts, because the AC-556 fire control parts will not fit in the semi-auto receiver. In addition, just for reference sake, the same is true with the stocks. This is our AC-556 stock, this is a plain semi-auto Mini-14 stock. You can see the Mini-14 stock has much less material removed. You can't fit an AC-556 receiver uh, into a plain Mini-14 stock. Uh, you can put the semi-auto into the full-auto stock, not that that really does anything for you, but um, mostly I say this as a caution. If you have an AC-556 and you are looking for a replacement stock, perhaps you want the wood stock or the folding stock, make sure that you get an AC-556 style one that has all of the inletting. Otherwise, your fancy machine gun will not fit in your new stock. All right, now fire control groups. Here's our plain semi-auto Mini-14. Looks just like an M1 Garand. Here is our AC-556 fire control stop, fire control uh, unit, which has these extra movie bits, which are going to... This is your selector lever, in effect. This guy right here is the three-round burst counter. And then we have some extra hardware at the back. So let's take a look at how this actually works. One of the neat things about the Mini-14 and AC-556 is that I can actually uh, assemble the fire control group to the receiver without the stock being in place, which makes it really cool and easy for me to show you how it works. Right off the bat, you can see here, this is why you don't try to assemble the gun with the selector switch anywhere other than semi-auto. If I have it in three round bursts there, and I try to put this together, you can see what's going to happen there. These pins are going to bend these sheet metal parts. Uh, Ruger stopped supporting these guns at the factory for any reason whatsoever, for any problem whatsoever, in 2009. So if you damage one of these today, uh, you have to find a gunsmith familiar with them to send it to to fix, because Ruger never sold full auto parts on the civilian market as spare parts, and they don't service the guns themselves anymore. So be very careful. Leave that in semi-auto, and then when you assemble it... No, we'll make sure this is all the way back. And then, now when I assemble it, these pieces just lock nicely together. There we go. So, this is semi-auto. 
none of these parts are interacting or doing anything, because it's semi-auto. Okay, now I want to switch over to just the fire control group to show you this a little bit better. So right in there are the gear teeth that uh, do the counting. When I pull the trigger, this whole thing is connected to the trigger itself. So that's going to drop down. And when it drops down, that little tooth on the hammer will interact with those cam, those lugs on the gear, and they will cause this to cycle uh, incrementally. So when I pull the trigger and recock the hammer, this is effect the effect of the gun cycling. Uh, this rotates. Now this would be the last shot of our burst, and the gun would not fire anymore, because this isn't going to be able to do anything. So now I'm going to release the trigger. Now we'll start a new three round burst. So pull the trigger, that's going to come forward, and it will increment one position right there when it cycles. And then this pin is held by our safety sear here, when this gets pulled up, which is to say the bolt is fully locked, that drops the hammer, that fires our second round. When it comes back, when the bolt cycles, it's going to increment us to position number two. This is again going to pull up. When the bolt goes forward, it's going to fire a second time, and then that is going to come back, that increments us to position three, and now, when this pulls up, it lifts into this little cutout, which means it's not actually pulling this up, and it's not releasing the hammer. So that is how you get a three round burst. Now that you've seen the three round burst, this will make more sense, I think. So in semi-auto, you can see that these parts aren't interacting with the cam wheel at all. So in three round burst mode, they are. So right here, this would be, this is on uh, round number two, of a burst. So if we set it to a burst and fire it, we'll get one more round, and then, and then just like that, we're in the end of burst cutout, and no more firing. Now if I move this to full auto, there's burst, there's a full auto, now this leg is going far enough that it doesn't even notice if it's on a cutout. It will always continue to fire. The burst, uh, the burst counting wheel is not going to stop it after three rounds, and so that's how the full auto system works. Whew! All right, now we can put this back together, which is a pretty simple affair. Stock goes in the front, and it's going to drop in right there. And then, just to reiterate, always make sure the selector switch is on semi, these parts are all the way back, this one's vertical, and then, and of course the safety is down, and then we can gently, there we go, that goes in. Never force these things, in fact that's a good rule of gun assembly and disassembly in general, never force it. If you're forcing it, you're probably doing something wrong. Anyway, now that this is together, a couple other quick little things to touch on. The AC556 uh, got a flash hider on it, which the regular Mini 14 did not, and it also had a front sight block that included a bayonet lug. So this could take a standard USGI M7 bayonet, the same one that would fit on an M16. And that was just kind of done for military purposes. I don't know how many people would actually need the bayonet on, on their AC556, but uh, if you want it to be a military rifle, that's kind of de rigueur. You need to have that. Having initially introduced these guns in 1979, Ruger continued to sell them until 1999, so a 20-year lifespan. I wouldn't call them a commercial failure, but obviously Ruger was hoping for a major military contract, and he never did get that. However, the guns certainly paid for themselves and made the company a nice profit. Um, they have historically been like the cheap option for a a registered transferable 5.56 rifle in the United States compared to an M16. Uh, typically, historically, at something like one-third the cost of a registered M16 of kind of any generic type. So um, they're a pretty interesting rifle in that regard. I have never actually fired one myself, so we're going to go ahead and do that. We're going to take this out to the range tomorrow and try it out. So stick around uh, if you're interested in seeing that. Thanks for watching.